Hello there. Welcome everyone to SureScript's first live video chat. And to celebrate National Health IT Week and our recently released National Progress Report, we're gonna discuss where health IT is today and how the business of interoperability can drive industry progress tomorrow. We have a great lineup of experts joining us today. Let's welcome Dr. Halamka, CIO of the Beth Israel Deaconess Health System and Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Shahid Shah, CEO, a founder of NetSpective Communications, and Dr. Stephen Waldron, Director, Alliance for eHealth Innovation at AAFP. Welcome. So let's kick off uh, this with the first question on interoperability today. Where are we now and where do we need to go? And let's start with you, Dr. Waldron. Well, I think we've made a fair amount of progress, but I think we have a long way to go as well. When I think about it, I go back to um, Steve Posniak um, many years ago when he talked about interoperability, said interoperability for what? And I think we've made a lot of progress on continuity of care. So we're getting data to be able to move from place to place. But I think where we need to really spend a lot of time and, and work moving forward is the notion of care coordination. So how do we actually make sure that the data is actionable and that providers and clinicians and, and patients that are in di disparate organizations, different technologies are able to work together uh, to help patients uh, live healthier lives? And I think that's where we need to kind of spend a lot of time and focus. Um, and I also think it's kind of one of the things that um, has been interesting for me as I've, I've seen SureScripts grow over the many years, you started very much about continuity, about moving scripts around, um, and now the conversation and the growth is in messaging and uh, medication management. So uh, I think it's a good um, kind of case study and where we could go with all the other types of interoperability as well. Great. Shahid, from where you sit, where, where, where are we now and where do we need to go? Yeah, it's a great question. I think where we are now is from a vendor perspective or a supply side perspective uh, where individuals see their problems like a, a digital health vendor or an EHR vendor or a labs vendor that where they see their problem pretty acutely and they know how to define it. That's going pretty well. So the supply side for vendor specific or uh, very uh, workflow specific areas, I think we're in good shape. Uh, and, and Stephen said it exactly right. Uh, uh, you know, the interoperability for what? When we can define that very precisely in very specific uh, innovator type terms, I think it's going uh, pretty well. And, and especially, uh, you know, things are going well when there are uh, big movements and things like fire uh, and and those APIs. And I'm really excited to see a couple of startups in this space like MI7 and Redox basically building their entire business on nothing other than uh, connectivity purely at the API level. So uh, we've had a, a lot of our traditional uh, vendors in the HL7 space and the uh, HL7 routers and, and those kind of things. The HL7 folks are doing a pretty good job there. But I can see that uh, where we need to go now is really help our uh, buy side or demand side um, uh, partners really understand how to ask what they need for what they need, how to define uh, the kinds of successes that they need to have based on the kinds of data and the outcomes they're looking for. So instead of hoping for interoperability broadly, I think where we need to go now is to say to our buy side partners to say, before you buy something, ask for these specific things, put these in your RFPs, and then we go from there. I think we're going to see a lot faster uh, in, input from them, and then we'll see a lot faster progress uh, from the community at large. Dr. Halamka? Sure. So I think Stephen and Shahid really teed it up nicely. I was talking to some senators the other day and said, well, what is interoperability? And they said the exchange of every data element, including toenail length and hair color, for every purpose with every stakeholder in real time for free. If that's your definition of interoperability, just give up now, right? We failed, not gonna happen. But my definition of interoperability is as an emergency physician, is the data I need to care for the patient in front of me when I need it without a huge amount of difficulty. A problem list, a medication list, an allergy list. And certainly in Boston, what we're seeing is the political barriers, the organizational barriers across organizations falling down because with MACRA and MIPS and quality and outcomes and ACOs and alternative payment models, you are going to die as an organization unless you share data. It's an organizational imperative. 
So I think, as they said, the technology has improved. And sure, there are things we need to work on. National patient identifier, national provider directory, homogeneous security and consent models, data governance, all these things. But our trajectory is good. All right. Well, so Shahid, you were just talking about the supply side. What can we learn by focusing on the demand side of the interoper interoperability equation? Yeah, and I think uh, uh, John mentioned it uh, pretty well a minute ago, is that if we really step back for a moment and say, um, who needs what at what time? And, and this is one area that, of course, uh, you know, SureScripts has done a, a really nice job defining a very specific problem domain, such as e-prescribing, and then everything around it. Uh, and, and then, you know, some of the new things that you guys have released, like the National Record Locator Service, and the fact that you're offering that free is really cool uh, over the next uh, couple of years. So when you look at it in a very specific way and you say, well, what are uh, the things that I'm going to need today? And, and for example, John mentioned provider directories. That's a whole other area that we could start paying special attention to and saying that in a very specific area, like we have, I mean, e-prescribing isn't a, a solved problem, but it's closer to solved than interoperability than almost any other area is. But if we pick these off one at a time and say, all right, here's, here's how we're going to do provider directory Here's how we're going to do uh, med list management. Uh, yesterday and today, I was at uh, the CAPG. CAPG is a uh, accountable physicians organization um, association. And then today I was at uh, NACOS, which is a national association of ACOs. Now, everybody there had the kind of wishes that John was just talking about from the senator's point of view, which is everything for everyone all the time. But uh, we start once you step back and say, okay, what are the specific things that an ACO needs for interoperability? It's actually not that big, as big as you know the, the universe is what we're thinking of. When you think about what uh, collaboration uh, desires are and what the needs are in specific use cases in order to get reimbursed, in order to get your utilization reports, in order to get your quality reports, it's not that bad. So when we do cut it down from that universe into manageable chunks and really teach buyers what that means and really to me it's as simple as saying if we don't have language that they can put into their request for proposal request for information reflect request for quotations and then help these buyers put those in there in a way like md fire for example a, a few years ago uh, helped medical device buyers say what should you buy or what should you ask for in your request for proposal from med device vendors. Well, something like that, an MD Fire-like system is also being prepared now uh, by uh, quite a few different groups. And, and, I, and I know that uh, uh, folks in Massachusetts have some of that standard language. But to me, that's really what we need to focus on is helping the C-suite, the boards, and uh, senior management in physician-led organizations, health systems, and other places really understand that the only way that you're going to get what you want is if you're going to pay for it and put it into your RFPs and not buy something that doesn't meet your needs. Perspective, Dr. Waldron. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I, I really agree. And I, I was thinking when you were talking about the demand side that a lot of the small practices that we deal with at the, the AAFP, you know, kind of spent their capital, either it be their financial or their intellectual capital or, or sometimes um, their mental capital to purchase a particular product. And then being able to say, well, I'm going to demand something different is a little bit more challenging. But I, I do think, though, that with interoperability, if we're able to get that a little bit farther along, then the ability to drive the end demand for other things that we desperately need in primary care, because we don't have the functionality set that we need for the coming um, value-based payment models of 2019 and beyond, that that can help. And really excited to hear some of the companies that are building stuff around the fire and going to, to John's point about, you know, what's the core data that we need, something we've been driving the AFP for a long time. Once you can get that out, get that 20% of data out, you got about 80% of the value. So I, I'm rambling just a little bit, but just really excited about how everything's kind of pull, getting pulled together um, uh, and moving forward. Great. Dr. Halamp, any other thoughts on that, sure. on that particular thought? That so in a world of macro and MIPS, we'll all be paid for outcomes and quality. And so what data does one need to submit quality measures for whatever, meaningful use, PQRS, IPPS, about 140 data elements you need to use point. And so what did we do? Contractually, as a member of our ACO, 
you must submit 140 data elements per encounter so we can measure quality and benchmark and understand variation new care management. If you cannot submit 140 data elements per encounter, you can't be a member of our ACO. So what happened? We had 26 different EHR vendors, including, hey, Steve, I hear your brother-in-law wrote an EHR, Fox Pro, MS-DOS 1.1, fabulous. All those little EHRs, and again, you know, some companies can be small and agile, but all the kinds of Fox Pro and DOS kinds of things couldn't generate interoperability. They are no longer used. Gone. We have six EHRs among 3,000 docs in the ACO because of the requirement contractually that you be interoperable. Where should vendors increase collaboration and focus their priorities in terms of that technology development? So where, what's your view, um, Gee. So I, I would say that uh, uh, in, in the way that uh, ACOs are being created uh, to help otherwise competitive organizations, like there are actually hospitals that are now working with physician practices or working with labs and imaging centers uh, in ways they never used to before and in a very more, in a more cooperative or what we like to refer in the technology inter industry in a more coopetition like environment, we need to make sure that our vendors are doing the same. So uh, I love what John just said about uh, how, uh, you know, making the requirement on the ACO from the business side forced the vendors to join in. So it, it's basically uh, the vendors were going to be punished uh, over time because they were not doing the kinds of interoperability that's necessary. So to me, that is the way that uh, the way of the future. So you think of like uh, about carry quality or uh, other kinds of uh, vendor li led um, interoperability efforts. I mean, I, I like those, but really those are supply side effort. I would just rather say every vendor who is part of this ACO come to the ACO as a group and say, this is not just like a, a, a physician organization is part of the ACO, we should extend that to those vendors and say, no vendor, you're also part of this ACO. So I think over the next few years, vendors who stop, step back and say, look, I'm going to help uh, the ACO or I'm going to help the collaborative care, not just one organization in there, but help the uh, organization as a whole, the virtual organization, and maybe even take some uh, some slight upside risk or maybe a little downside risk. That kind of uh, a membership kind of model where the vendor is held to the same accountability as the provider is, seems to me to be a good direction for us to take and one way to ensure that everyone is aligned equally on the incentives instead of it ha haphazardly where the vendor is going to benefit regardless of whether or not uh, a particular member of an ACO or a member of a health system or a part of a group, even if they succeed or fail. So when you have misaligned incentives like this, I think it's going to be a challenge. So I, I like that idea of getting the vendors to participate almost equally if possible. Dr. Halamka? So two thoughts for our vendors. So the first is, you know, Epic, Cerner, Meditech, Ethene, Clinical Works, name your vendor. They are core transactional systems. Do I think that they are going to lead the next generation of innovation? Actually, I don't. I mean, they're going to be compliance and regulatory and billing and all the things we all need for data integrity. But it's going to be the 26-year-olds in the garage. It'll be the entrepreneurial for-profit companies. These are the folks who will come up with the next generation of innovation. So all our vendors need to agree that we need an ecosystem that's a bit iPhone-like. They'll provide the phone, but the vendors in the world provide the apps, and they need to be able to collaborate and be part of a greater ecosystem. The future belongs to modules and web-based and cloud services that plug into the EHR, not a walled garden of EHRs themselves. Second area is we all know that EHRs have different data schemas, and that's okay. However, over the wire, our vendors need to agree to exchange data using archetypes, standard schemas. What do I mean? When I was two years old, 1964, my mom gave me ampicillin. I had two red dots on my stomach and she said, you're allergic to penicillin. So I'll ask my primary care specialist, Steve, if I had a life-threatening streptococcal infection right now, and you knew it was my mom in 1964 that thought I had two red dots, would you give me penicillin? You know, yeah, I'd give you a, yeah, I'd probably give Benadryl too, but yeah, I, I would definitely give it to you. 
What if it was a doc who yesterday saw me anaphylax because I got near a penicillin container? Well, probably not. <laughs> so guys, you know, let's agree that an allergy is the stuff you react to, the reaction you had, the person who observed it, the level of certainty in the time date stamp. Don't care how you store it in your database, but over the wire, those are the data elements you need. So that's the kind of work our vendors should collaborate on. And that's the example in the FIRE project and Argonaut, the kind of thing we're working on. Great. You know, and Mary, Any comments on the vendors, Dr. Waldron? Well, I, I was just going to say, I think both comments really set the stage, I think, for me that success of interoperability for a vendor up till now has been, do you support a particular standard? Do you pass some level of certification? And I think moving forward is that do you provide value to on this on the demand side to an ACO to help them take care of what they need to do so they can align their incentives? Or it's the vendor that you're actually able to add value to the, the provider. I, I'm hopeful in the next you know 10 plus years that our, our measure of success is not going to be about transactions or supporting a particular standard, but about the value that's being generated by the products. Yeah, if I could just add one thing uh, there, Mary, is that uh, if you look at other uh, industries, let's say, take a look at the building industry um, as, as one example, because we walk into buildings all the time. But in the building industry, you do have what are called building codes, right? You have a code that says if you have an apartment building, here's what it's going to do. If you have uh, an office building, here's how it needs to be. And so, so uh, what we started to look at for in the software and interoperability world is similar to building codes where we say, we're all going to follow this broad kind of uh, standard and, and make sure that our foundations are good and that our walls are up to spec, et cetera. But you don't actually say that a building is good and that people can get in until you uh, review that regulation regulation after the building is built. So everybody who builds a building is responsible for the instance of the building, not their particular wall, not the floor and other areas. So when you look at this example, just like, for example, a elevator is regulated uh, outside, uh, before it comes into the building, but once it's installed, that elevator company must uh, establish and say, in this building with this many number of floors at the speed that it's going at, I'm not going to kill anybody, right? So this right. idea of building codes to say that, uh, like the standards and things like uh, John and Steve both talked about, that's great. We need to make sure we do that. But we don't have this model where once you install it, you all come together and make sure that everything is actually working. So this is the tough part. And, and having been in the EHR world for a long time as a, as a perpetrator of some of the problems in EHRs as a builder of one, this is some things that we've never done. We say, okay, this is my software product. I finished it. I've installed it. Um, when you have a problem with my product, please call me. And whenever they called me, the first thing I tried to do is to make sure it was somebody else's problem. And that's a natural state of affairs from from a uh, from a small to medium sized mm -hmm. vendor perspective. A larger vendor sometimes do a better job with supporting multiple bases, but we're not integration friendly. We don't know and we don't realize as vendors that it is the instance that is integrated into a complex environment, like even a small physician's practice is a complex environment. That's the area where we need to say that we are watching out for interoperability, safety, reliability, user experience as a whole. We've got years to be able to understand what that means, uh, put our own, quote, building codes uh, in place and figure out how to certify something, not before it comes into the environment, but certify it after I, I put it into Steve's environment or John's environment. That's when it should be certified. Having certification before you walk into an environment is not very helpful. We've talked uh, about the vendors. Uh, we've talked about the healthcare organizations. Maybe we can switch a little bit and talk about patients. And I'm wondering um, if all of you or, or those of you that uh, share any sort of real world examples of how access to patient information and interoperability really helped improve outcomes or reduce errors. And I'll open it up to. Well, uh, please go Steve. Go Steve. I was going to say, I, mean, I can give a personal example. Um, you know, my wife had a, a medical problem and we were at a hospital and it was at a place that, you know, couldn't do that. You had to go to a tertiary care center, uh, which luckily for us was in the same town. Um, but by the time that I was able to drive halfway across the city, uh, which I drove a little fast, um, got there before the ambulance. Uh, when I made it up to the, the ICU, the surgeon was already there 
had already reviewed the entire CT scan at the other hospital, had already formulated the plan for the surgery, had everything done, and actually had time to sit down and chat with me about what was going to happen and why it was going to happen. Um, and that was great. And I think that was a, just a perfect example of interoperability that really worked. Um, Fast, fast, just real quick, fast forward a, a couple of months later, she has a problem. So we show up at the emergency room again to the place that um, she was seen the second time. Well, now they can't access the, the first um, CT scan because it was no longer available in the marketplace. So they couldn't be able to compare old against new. So they had to compare the one post-surgery that was done at that, that hospital. So again, it was this notion that they fixed the interoperability problem saying in the emergency that you have that available, but then it wasn't retained or wasn't available then because it was needed in, in follow-up. Um, so just again, just example that even with great interoperability, you have to really focus on that demand side, I think, and understand the clinical scenario that's needed to support that data. Yeah. Well, let me give you a good and a bad example. So the good example, two months ago, my wife felt fatigued, had a high heart rate and unexpected weight loss, said that her hair was getting a bit rough and a little thinning. She described hyperthyroidism perfectly. She talked to her PCP using electronic messaging. She went to her lab and got her test results that were shared with her PCP and her electronically. We brought in an endocrinologist electronically. And at the end of the visit, he prescribed methamazole to the Walgreens 25 feet from our house electronically. So from symptoms to diagnosis to treatment in 48 hours with patient, specialist, and PCP all working together electronically. Exactly how you and your families would probably like healthcare to be delivered. Bad example, a few years ago, so this hasn't happened recently, my mother broke her hip, went to a meaningful use certified EHR using hospital who was not able to get the PCP's medication list and therefore created medication reconciliation using empty plastic pill bottles from my mom's house. Not a very satisfactory result. And she was put on medications that were inappropriate ended up having an aspiration pneumonia, ended up doing okay, but it was a medication error complication because of a lack of interoperability. And it's the kind of thing you guys are doing today at Scripts with record locator services, with history of prescribing that will solve those kinds of issues. Me, do you want to? I would just add there that uh, um, when we talk to patients, if we suggest that they really do take uh, responsibility and accountability uh, for checking um, before and after a visit, whenever possible, obviously they can't do that in an emergency. But ever since I talked to, for example, my dad and my family and others uh, who are visiting, when I say that um, you are accountable and responsible for your medical record in totality, any one organization might be might be okay with a part of a medical record and other organization has another part of the medical record but really we're the patients it's our record we should be responsible for it and what i found is that like in, in the last several examples just i'll give you an example for, for my dad before he went to the facility he looked on his personal health record looked at the uh, um, records that were in there saw that labs weren't uh, delivered uh, he didn't see them but it turned out that he called and said oh yeah the doctor can see them only my dad couldn't then afterwards, like going to an imaging and other places, uh, I tell my dad, as soon as you get it, uh, you know, it, you go and check to make sure that they were in the records before you leave and after you come back. One of the things that we're, uh, sometimes we are at fault on the IT side, we make things look more magical than they will ever be. And this idea that um, the interoperability is uh, the responsibility of a certain group today just doesn't exist. Nobody knows who's actually responsible for interoperability. So I think that if we make the case as a whole uh, and say it is the patient that is responsible to ensure that the, that, that the records are um, in their whatever central location or multiple locations they have, uh, like in, my, in the case of my mom and my dad, they each have multiple PHRs for every uh, doctor that they go to. But I say, hey, that's, that's okay. At least you have access to it and you can talk to them about it. So I'd like to say from a patient perspective, Things are getting better uh, over time, and we have things like uh, higher copays, higher deductibles. 
it's putting more and more pressure, financial pressure on us as patients. So we're starting to take more and more notice of what's going on. But I think that as we go forward and, you know, Mary, we've talked about at SureScripts, you know, trying to see how could you take some of the things that you already know in your network, expose it through EHRs, expose it through other places like uh, John and Stephen just said, to get to the patients to give the kinds of uh, good and um, even better example, like the one with Stephen, where before he walked in, he the, the record has already been seen. I mean, that's just amazing. And I, th those are the kind of things that we just need to tell our patients that is possible, but you're responsible and accountable. Whereas the uh, vendors, by the way, they have responsibility. Uh, providers have responsibility as well. But as a patient, you should feel you're fully accountable. Does Do I have everything that everybody else knows? And can I make sure that everybody can see it, at least for the next few years until Panacea arrives? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. With the trend of consumerism and the um, the demand for the transparency, I know that something that we're working on in terms of just getting more cost information, better formulary information, uh, is going to help the overall uh, ecosystem. We've got a best maybe two or three minutes left. I'll leave it to you all to make some closing comments. Uh, and just want to just first say thank you to being on our first live IT chat. And but I'll just let you guys go around and have some closing comments. Uh, sure, I'll just say something really quick. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, especially um, one thing that we should all learn, uh, and, and I'm not just uh, um, pushing it because it's a SureScripts uh, uh, event here, but SureScripts uh, started the problem solving in the right way. Pick something important, make sure that everybody cares about it uniformly. Like if there, there's nobody's going to tell you, oh, meds aren't important. And as we're starting to hit interoperability going forward, let's look at it in a stakeholder specific, condition specific workflow specific manner and say, how can I attack something one by one by one so that within a few years, we've hit so many of these that now we see a unified approach on how interoperability can be solved. And definitely check out, I just saw the news today that the uh, National Record Locator Service would be made free up until 2019 yes. uh, to all EHR vendors. That's awesome. Uh, uh, now, now nobody's got an excuse, right? So uh, uh, go forth and conquer here, I guess. Right. And to amplify those remarks, be tactical. Every time I'm in Washington and I hear we haven't solved interoperability. Well, you haven't boiled the ocean with a lighter either. You know, what you need to do <laughs> is say, I want to achieve medication reconciliation in a more automatic fashion. I want problem lists to be reconciled and allergies to be exchanged. Why? Very tactical, doable technology and standards are mature. The barriers are largely prioritization and organizational inertia. So be focused. Embrace the tools and technologies around us, and you can make good things happen. Excellent. Dr. Waldron? Yeah, I should have went first. Uh, I don't know how I could kind of compete with those two. I, I clearly agree on the context that um, you need, need to focus on the clinical situation that you talked about, Sadid, and um, talk a lot about um, doing it a stepwise approach, like Dr. Alonka had, had said. Again, I think from my standpoint is keep a, keep an eye on why we're doing interoperability. Um, it's not to move bits around, it's to take care of patients and to help them uh, take better life, have better lives. Um, and if we think, focus on that, I think things will do a lot better and really excited about some of the changes on the business side of things. Um, I think that's been one of the big challenges with interoperability is we've been trying to push rope as uh, Dr. John White talks about, and now we have an opportunity to pull it. And we've seen with SureScripts what you can do if you pull in our operability. So really excited about what's potential going to happen for the rest of healthcare. Excellent. Well, thank you again for your time and for everyone joining and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you.